Uh, hello, this is Chuck Braverman. This is episode number 39 of Westock Online. Um, we are brought to you again by Real Screen in part. Uh, Real Screen Magazine is an online and print magazine all about documentary and reality filmmaking. And they have their Real Screen Summit coming up in January, January 27th to the 30th. Go to summit.realscreen.com to register. I strongly advise it if you're in the business and you want to know what's going on in the reality or documentary world. Uh, today we have two guests, two for the price of one, um, and it's from a film that has an odd title, but after you see the film, you'll understand what the title means. The title of the, the film, which is premiering this week at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, the title is this is not a movie, but in fact, it really is a movie. But let's take a look at a clip and then we'll meet our guests. I think that if you watch wars, and out here you do, history, unfortunately, in the Middle East is about largely wars. The making of history, the construction of politics is done through violence. And I think that you're watching history happen and you're telling people about it. And I think what happens is that you develop the idea that the old ideas of journalism, that you've got to be neutral and take nobody's side, is rubbish. I think as a journalist, you've got to be neutral and unbiased on the side of those who suffer. I'm a person writing this. I'm not an agency tap, tap, tapping away on a machine. People say, oh, you know, you're letting your feelings show. Why not? I'm the nerve ending. I'm not a machine. What I try to do when I'm writing, I try to talk to the reader like someone they know. I'm trying to write as if I'm writing to a friend. You won't believe what I've just seen. That's the key to getting people to understand what's going on. Hello, Young Chang, who's Hello. the producer, Hi. director, and Robert Fisk, who was the subject of this film, which is, this is not a movie, but of course, it very much I'll is. I'll describe it, I'm just the director. I'm just the director. Oh. We had a bunch of great producers on the film. Okay, well, I'm, Apologize for giving you extra credit, no but I, I'm sure being out in the field, being the director, you were producing somewhat also, but I understand. Um, so uh, let's start with you, Young, if we can. If, I'm, I'm a fan of yours from up the Yangtze a couple of years ago, which was an amazing journey on this cruise boat that was bending rivers and jamming dams and moving people around and telling a great story. And now you've come up with this fabulous film about Robert Fisk, who um, I, I obviously has been reporting for a number of years. And you want to tell us a little bit about how this film started, please? Yeah, I think, I think it started um, mostly around this, this concern, this question uh, you know, I think I made this film as a sort of reset button um, uh, around the idea of being inundated, overwhelmed by 20, the 24-hour news cycle and uh, and information that I couldn't discern what was true or false. You know, and I and I needed to have some kind of logic and a way to understand that. And so I, I made this film called This Is Not a Movie, which is sort of a film essay, but through the eyes of uh, Robert Fitt, the, uh, the journalist, the Middle East correspondent for the Independent, and um, and wanted to uh, look through him as a sort of a, a source to to understand uh, journalism better. And and I think he was a very uh, uh, you were useful, Robert. <laughs> so yeah, that was um, so. In a nutshell, the film is about. Uh, I think looks at Robert Fisk's career and uses his life as a sort of a, as the portrait, but through it, much like the like a film by uh, that I that I used as a reference, Manufacturing Consent, uh, the film about Noam Chomsky, uh, directed by Mark Akbar and Peter Wintonic, as a sort of model for the way to make this essay uh, come about. And and the key is about the reflections on journalism, reporting. Um, you know, uh, how to report, uh, that kind of thing. So these are obviously turbulent times. And as an American watching this film, it was uh, disturbing 
to me to think that certain events have happened and been reported one way and then uh, finding out after the fact that maybe we didn't get the whole truth here that uh, Mr. Fisk you know, was referred to the bombings and killings of some people in the, in the Middle East. I don't know. Uh, um, are you getting, uh, how, what kind of reactions are you getting to that? And I mean disturbing in a good way that we're, that we're finding out this information. The truth seems to always come out sooner or later. Um, <laughs> I see the finger pointing to me here. Uh, yeah, no, um, no, the reactions. So we just had our world premiere screening uh, last night to a, a fully packed um, cinema here at the Toronto Film Festival. And um, I, I believe they had to turn away a hundred people lining up outside. Um, uh, it was um, very well received. I, I think uh, I have, I like when I watch my own film, and I only do it maybe once or twice, and it's usually for the premiere kind of thing. I usually sit way back in the back of the theater, and I was able to, uh, you know, down and see the tops of heads in the cinema. And one thing I look for is how people are moving in the seats and shifting and you know repositioning. Is, and to me, that's a that's a signal that they're uh, they're bored or they're you know or falling asleep or falling <laughs> or falling asleep or, or trying to trying to stay awake. Uh, so uh, that didn't happen. Everyone was stock still, and you could feel the in the room the sort of um, focus. I think uh, the film I would describe as quite relentless. It's in a good way. It's through Robert's voice. You, he's throwing ideas at you, and um, and it's a lot of information. It's, it, it really, I think, forces you to think. And um, uh, uh, at one moment, I think well, that was really quite. I didn't anticipate uh, when Robert was talking about the Stavro Chitila massacre uh, and how it shaped, uh, reshaped how he thought of he would approach journalism through the eyes of those who suffer and report for those who suffer. And there was a, 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 an applause in the audience uh, when he, you know, very angrily kind of positions this this change in his in his um, approach to journalism. That was quite a moment. So yeah, I, I think people in post conversation, screening conversation, you know, I've been getting from people that this is um, a film that they've never seen, something like this they've never seen before, sort of topics uh, about, you know, and, I, and I know Robert doesn't like the word truth, so I really wouldn't like quote, but you know, sort of how we think about, uh, you know, reporting the truth, um, you know, and, and how we can, you know, how a foreign correspondent has to translate and interpret the news for people back in their home country, you know. And I, I think that was something else that I wanted to kind of throw at the audience to, to consider, you know. And I think, you know, Robert has a lot to say about those ideas. And I think it comes through in the film. And I think it really had an uh, emotional connection to people. Well, you know, like I said, it couldn't be more important, especially in this day and age. And the thing that my first gut instinct was to go to the online of the independent and start looking around and finding stuff that was there with, with, with Robert. And, and I kind of regretted that I hadn't been following you for years. Um, and your books certainly look interesting. Um, with so back is now being, uh... Oh, you, you now understood that you should be reading the independent online. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a it's a good idea, and I think how I'm this is you know indirectly uh, a fantastic uh, uh, commercial is not the right word, but you know it's a plug for the independent, and and for 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 you, Mr. Fisk, it sort of shocks me that I consider myself pretty well read. Uh, you know, I read three or four newspapers a day, but the papers that I read, I'm not seeing you online. And I wish there was some way, you know, that you could uh, be in the New York Times or the Washington Post. Or, but I'm oh, certainly going to... Oh, 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 oh. well, the day what? I appear in the New York Times, you won't be able to trust me anymore. <laughs> well, I don't know what that says about the Times. I, it says, says something. I, you know... Um, I don't know, maybe I had to think about that a little more. Uh, <laughs> what was it like having a camera uh, pointed at you uh, 
And you know, and I'm curious. Is obviously there was a lot of footage that came from from uh, somebody else shooting years ago. But I, I'm curious where that footage came from and how was it to have uh, Young following you around <clears throat> with the crew? Well, I can uh, uh, let me first of all say that I, I work not not for him. I work for the Independent. I'm their Middle East correspondent. I've been in the Middle East for 43 years, and I have done other films. What I was concerned about when I met Jan, and I was not convinced I wanted to do, be involved in another movie, not of this complexity, was the degree to which they would have to follow me and follow me doing my assignments and my work for the independent. I would not be doing interviews for them. In fact, everything you see in the film. And a lot of material couldn't be put in there. You can read it all in the independent. And sometimes greater length than you'll see it in the film. What convinced me that I would do it with Jan and with Dre, the director of cinematography, was first of all that uh, Dre came from Iraq, so he knew the Arab world better than I did. Secondly, um, when he came on a Ricky to Beirut, Jan did not do what almost all Western journalists do which is to tell Arab what they thought was going on. He, he sat down and listened to them, and I thought, well, this guy who might be worth working with. And I said to him, basically, look, if you want, you can take a camera, I can get you lots of places, but you're going to have to film me as I do my work. I'm not doing reshoots. I'm not going to reposition interview subjects. I'm not going to ask questions at your request. I, make, I do the questions. It's my work. And if you miss a shot, you miss it. If you get it, good luck. And Young agreed with it, which I was very happy about. I said, okay, look, as long as it starts working okay, we'll see how we go. Uh, Robert's journalistic integrity then informed our, our, of course, the technique in which we would film it. So that's why we reduced the size of the cameras. We got more nimble. We knew we had to chase along with him the stories that he was chasing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and that then uh, gave us the style and the look of the movie. Um, the other challenge that uh, outside of the present day filmmaking was this idea of using archive and going back and forth between past and present. And that was something that didn't come out until we were in the editing room. Um, that structure, we knew we wanted to do that approach. And in particular, it was inspired by Robert. Um, just my time I spent with Robert, would, for example, we'd walk down the street in Beirut and he'd be able to point out different historic references to the past. Uh, uh, an assassination, a massacre, and then it changed the, sh the shape of what the present day, um, you know, that street was. You know, it wasn't just a street anymore uh, where you could buy a newspaper. It, the, the, the past is so intertwined. And I think that is that directly inspired how I wanted to make the film uh, structurally. So um, uh, it was a, it, that was a challenge in the editing room. We spent about a year cutting the film. Uh, finding ways to organically go back and forth between you know our present day footage with Robert's archives and the two that you that we referenced, which is the the BBC documentary from 1972. No, 1992. 1992 is the book of Beirut, but the, yeah. the BBC one, Ireland, Northern oh, Ireland. Ireland would have been 1972. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's uh, take a look at another very short clip and then continue this conversation. When I went up to Idlib province, all my colleagues were saying, Idlib battle about to begin. But in that whole trip, I didn't see another journalist. I didn't even see a Russian journalist. If you don't go to the scene and sniff it and talk to the people and see it with your own eyes, you cannot get near what the truth is. I more and more feel, especially in the age of the internet, when so little is proved and so little checked out, that there's more and more reason to do the old kind of journalism that I was doing in Belfast, padding around to find out what I actually see. And have a notebook and a pencil or a pen. It's just as valuable today as it always was. A long time ago. You no, know, it's funny. I wa when I watched this film the other day, my first instinct was I wanted to show it to my documentary filmmaking class, and how important it is to, you know, be there and have some accuracy and and uh, be on the ground, you know, where things are happening, and and, and that they 
they have some of this because the documentary filmmakers in some ways are becoming the, the journalists of, of today because the journalists are disappearing. And I'm very much afraid of, you know, I watch my local newspaper, the New York Times, even though it's been now bought and sold, you know, three or four times in the last 10 years and it has a new owner and I'm, I've got hopes for it, but I, I feel it on Sunday, particularly it's thinner than it used to be, you know, and so I'm concerned it's about the future. Thing. Well, I mean, it, it needs that, it needs that, those advertisers and dollars to, to pay for those journalists, right? And, and I think the LA Times has some very good journalists and I'm just hope that they, that they can survive. I mean, my, the local, local paper in the community outside of LA where I live is really thin in terms of real news. Um, let, can we ask for a moment, uh, uh, Young, about the actual logistics of the shoot? You talked about small cameras. Were you the cameraman? No, you had credited cameramen, as I recall, in the credits. And what were they actually shooting? And you just have a wireless. What was your what did your crew consist of? I, I like and I consistently work with a very small crew, uh, generally, and in particular with this film, I had a cinematographer. A very, you know, I look for cinematographers who can shoot and film with a cinematic sort of sensibility. And my, my cinematographer was Gerard Munajim, an Iraqi-Canadian uh, cinematographer who was, in fact, my classmate when I studied cinema in Montreal many years ago. And uh, Duret approaches with a uh, sort of an analog, if I can say, with meaning film kind of approach. He, he does shoot a lot of film on film. Um, and so we, we adapted that to the digital realm, uh, which is uh, shooting with very small cameras like the Blackmagic Mini was our A camera. And we would switch. We, we decided we would be very fluid between different sorts of cameras because we'd be mixing in the film with archive, multiple different, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, uh, quality, video quality. Um, so you see that throughout the movie. So our cameras were the, um, we had a Sony A, A7, I think it's Sony A7, I think it's called. Um, forgive me if I don't know that. That's great territory. But, um, but uh, you know, nimble, small cameras. And the point of that also was to break down that the feeling that Robert had to be some sort of presenter or host. You know, that wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to actually make it feel as if we were we were invisible to some sense of the word where we are just tagging along with Robert. Camera isn't even present. And it happened on occasion, especially uh, in the Bosnian sequence when we when Robert approaches uh, Ifet Kernich, um and, uh, and, and and we caught the moment on camera when he didn't even flinch, you know, where, where Robert was questioning him about about uh, the signature from the Aleppo manuals that were found. Uh, sorry, the manuals from Bosnia, Bosnia that were found in Aleppo. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think that was sort of uh, the technical logistical approach. Um, I would add also that uh, I recently came across an interview with Laura Poitras, the, the, the filmmaker who I worked with before on a film, uh, Gatekeeper, that I made with Field of Vision. And I read that she talked about um, documentary filmmaking as, she calls it uh, documentary plus. It's, it's um, you know, very strong fact checking with, uh, with storytelling. And I think that is something that is unique to documentary filmmaking. We can uh, elongate the, the, the uh, you know, how we go into telling a story. We don't have to, we're not limited in a way um, to some short form news reportage. That's essentially the difference. I know there's another conversation about, you know, that we are as in cinema and commercial documentary, you know, sort of limited in time in the temporal to around a 90 minute, you know, 110 minute film, which can, which is not the equivalent to a tome that would Robert would write, write like the uh, Great Work of Civilization, which, you know, is, is just all encompassing and, and, and feels you, you know, and I think cinema does it differently though. I think it does it emotionally. Uh, in another way, I know that you're writing with emotional and reached that way too. But, but I think there's a uh, a visual kind of approach to the documentary process that I think um, can be encapsulated in a, uh, in, a sh in a in a different way than the written word. But I know you have some interesting. I just I'm thinking, Robert, you have some interesting thoughts on 
and what a movie does, the, 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 the power of, the, of cinema. Well, I think um, if I could carry on for what Jan was saying, yeah. I, I was reflecting the other day that, um, you know, I, I miss very much uh, the independent of the newspaper. You know, we, we went uh, uh, online about two years ago, and uh, my first thought was, well, let's see if it survives. It appears to be surviving without being an actual newspaper. And I, mi I miss the paper. I miss smelling it, print, holding it. Um, but I look back now and I say to myself, well, in those days, when we had a newspaper, I'd constantly be saying, okay, I'm going to file 950 words on this important story. Then the foreign desk would come back and say, can we keep it 800 words? Then they'd come back and say, will it hold till next week? Because we lost two pages or four pages or a new advertisement had come in or another story had broken. And maybe out of the you know circulation, I had 60, 70,000 readers, and of course it would be syndicated elsewhere. And now in the, you know, the, the website, and I'm not very fond of websites as institutions, um, I can write 5,000 words, and in one hour it's gone out to a million, two million, three million readers, and I'm a journalist, I want people to read it. So in, in that sense, um, I've actually, with the technology, I've got a much bigger length I can I, I, I can spread what I want to say much more and get it out much more quickly and to more people. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that, for example, every story that I cover in the film, and quite a number of stories that they couldn't fit in because they had, you know, six hours of working film, 20 hours of footage, um, they often appeared at longer length than the independent, longer to read, than you see in the actual film of what they use of the interview. Um, but at the same time, I, you know, I'm not against new technology. My problem with journalism now um, is the fact that the new technology allows the media to think that they can cover uh, major stories in places of great tragedy by looking at uh, Facebook friends and Google and uh, seeing what the agencies are saying and combining a couple of paragraphs in the New York Times. Um, <clears throat> I always say to my colleagues in the Middle East that, you know, if you can... Um, if you couldn't write the story you're writing here in Greenland, what are you doing in the Middle East? Uh, the purpose of being here is to see what's happening. Uh, and that usually means physically getting on a plane or getting on a train or a car and going to a battlefront, a scene of a uh, confrontation between the house and the Israelis, an investigation in, uh, in Bosnia, for example. Um, where, you know, what had happened, in fact, is in, in a basement of East Aleppo, the, the town, um, uh, a building that had been bombed, I discovered a huge story of that, along with all the documents showing where it had been sent from, uh, the factory in Bosnia. And the man who had signed the weapons off, and what I was going to know is, I wanted to know, well, let's find this guy and ask him where he sent his mortars. More mortars, by the way, than there are in the whole of the um, Canadian Army. So we went, or well, they came along with me to Bosnia, and with the help of my um, third contacts from the old NATO war, um, we found the guy. Um, and you see us finding him on the film. And I brought out this document. His name was Ifet Kurnic. And I said, Is that you? And he says, That my signature. And I said, Who did you sell these weapons to? He said, Saudi Arabia. They came here to the factory. And I think, got it. That is what one of the reasons I love doing journalism, digging out stories and getting them and proving that this is what happened. And the problem is that if, for example, without the proper resources, without being able to travel, how would I have done this story? Would I have emailed some NGO in Belgrade and say, do you have any friends in Sarajevo? And can they ring up anyone called Kurnic? And it wouldn't work. And you've got to go there. And the other thing, of course, is that having on film, and we'll have the photographs as well for the, for the independent, it provides an unstoppable power to convince. And one of the things about film for me, uh, and I should add that when I was at school, I wanted to be a film crew because I didn't make it, I ended up in Beirut. But um, film does with a combination of you know, music, drama, um, the actors are real people, um, <clears throat> and extraordinary photographic quality. Um, it, it's got all the arts in it. It cannot but be more powerful. It, it's got to be more powerful than anything else. Orchestra, me trying to write the story. And suddenly to see on the big screen last night for the first time, um, if at Koenig actually saying that's my signature, we sent it to the Saudis. 
I just, I just thought, God. Was there anything in the movie that you saw that you you cringed at or you looked to <laughs> the and yes. said, I, 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 why did you put that in there? Why am, what, is it too, is it too late? Look, I watched the film, I turned the, on the small screen on my laptop in Beirut on a week ago today. And um, my first reaction was, oh God, what an irritating man, Robert. <laughs> waffling on and on and on. I said, How can I take any more of this? You know, <laughs> I, I really got pretty tired of me. But that was just because, of course, I'm used to, you know, expressing my views, nothing print from lectures and so on around the world. Um, but then I began also to realize I think because of this way in which um, Young had merged in me as a cub reporter in Belfast and then me in the Middle East 25 years ago, and then me as a six-year-old on the beach at Hastings, England, and then pictures of my dad as a soldier in the First World War, uh, I realized how little I had changed and how much my views had remained the same since I was upsetting the British Army, upsetting authority, of course, in, um, in Belfast. And I also reflected watching my, the fun I had reporting the stories, which you see in the film. What a great job I've got, what a great life I've had. So I want to take a look at another very short clip and see if we have any comments on it. Mahaba. In Beirut. Where are you? Uh, Mukhtar or uh, Badin. No, no, no. No. What are you I'm uh, Robert Fisk, Sahafi Inglesi, in uh, Jurida, London Times. When I first got a letter from my then foreign editor, Louis Heron, from the Times, when I was in Portugal covering the aftermath of the revolution, he offered me the Middle East. I felt a bit like an Arab king being offered a country by Winston Churchill. And he said, you know, it will be a great adventure with lots of sunshine. You know, lots of sunshine. God, he's right about that. Lawrence of Arabia called Sunshine a Sword, and he's about right. Midsummer in the Gulf. The number of times in Beirut at risk, I've gone out on stories and written them. And by and large, I know that when I file a story, it's going to be printed. And for all I know, Rupert Murdoch may have cloven hooves, but uh, he's bringing my paper out every night and I'm a journalist and that's what I want. When I joined the Times, it printed what I wrote fairly, unchanged, untouched. Then Murdoch came and took the Times over, promised he would make no changes at all, have no influence on editorial policy. Of course he did. And headlines would suddenly take a very right-wing view of what I was writing about, even contradicting what I was actually saying in my copy. Didn't come as a shock when I saw that, and that, that's for sure. I'm just, uh, I just wonder if, if you want to comment on that. Murdoch. <laughs> well, I mean, the result was that um, I went down to the Gulf at uh, very high speed when the um, uh, USS Vincennes shot down a civilian Iranian passenger airline in 1988, and I found from tape recordings which were made by British air traffic controllers at the Bay International Airport, who were transit, that the Americans had panicked on board, couldn't even find a civilian passenger timetable, convinced themselves that the pilot of the passenger aircraft, the Iranian pilot, was a suicide pilot, and so they shut it down. And uh, that night I waited, and my story didn't run. And it was exclusive, I had the evidence, I had the quotes, um, and I thought, I'm no longer working for the time. If I have uh, an editor who doesn't have the courage to print a story, which is not going to go along with uh, Murdoch policy, then um, I have no business risking my life for this paper. So I joined the independent. So, so if people want to follow you now, what is the website and how do they find you online? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a bitter irony. I'm not a technology. A bitter irony. A bitter irony. I'm not a technology. <laughs> if you go to the independent um, and look up just an ordinary website, you'll find Robert Fisk underneath it. What I tell friends to do in America, Google Robert Fisk in the independent and you'll see all the recent stories underneath it. And I think it's probably free still in America. And if it's not, you'll find out how to subscribe to it. Um, I, I like the idea of you know, free websites, but 
somebody's got to pay my um, air travel to the Gulf of Cairo and so on. You know, yeah. journalism is not a charity. I would also add that right. you've written some, um, you know, very important books, and that may be the best place to start. Also, yeah, I mean, <laughs> a Great War for Civilization is one. Uh, Pity the Nation on Lebanon. And um, the book, writings too. Age of the Warrior. Writings. A collected writing on Age of the Warrior. Uh, I'm at present working on a new book, and I'm in manuscript. I'm on page one thousand five hundred and sixty-two. So it's going to be a big toe. <laughs> and I did look, and most of your books, I think, are available on Amazon. Uh, Young, I want to ask you another quick question about National Film Board, just out of curiosity. Uh, when I graduated film school several months ago. <laughs> I actually spent the summer in Montreal. And oh, I, yeah. and at the time, it seemed to me like the, the film board was making, you know, really uh, the best, best films around and, and they offered me a job. It was the timing, though, it, I just couldn't imagine oh. staying in Montreal at the time. I mean, I would have lost my citizenship probably. Uh, but, you know, the film board has made great films over the years, many, many great films. I'm just curious, what exactly is the relationship to the the film board? I see their logo on the film. So how does that work for you? Well, they were they were one of the, uh, Anita Lee is a, producer, is a producer and uh, from the National Film Board of Canada. Uh, the, the, the NFB initially um, you know, worked with Nelly Rivera, producer, to uh, research the background story on, on, on the Robert Fitz film. So it started early with the National Film of Canada. Um, uh, afterwards, they, they, you know, they contacted me, and then that's how I got attached to the film. And then, um, and then we brought in the other producers, and, and uh, uh, Alice Luchak and, and Ingmar Trott from Germany, the German Canada co-production. So, is there uh, a natural Stillwater. outlet in the states somewhere because you have the NFB and and these other stations, yeah, or is it, a, I mean, is it a slog, or is it difficult to get on the air in the States? No, no, uh, we, we haven't, um, this is why we're launching the film in, at the Toronto International Film Festival. One of the reasons is we are, you know, looking for a uh, distributor in the U.S., um, and that's something that the film board is um, is working on currently, and uh, uh, I have no idea, but I am, I'm, I'm expecting that we're going to have a theatrical release uh, at some point in the U.S. and a, and a broadcast on one of the um, one of the networks, but um, uh, I certainly but yeah, I, so. think, I think I can add something to the, the National Board of Canada. I mean, I think it takes quite a quite a you know a bold organization, an institution, a Canadian institution. Uh, it's it's sort of um, remarkable that they are able to support a film like this and allow filmmakers to, to independently. Uh, produce projects that are uh, that question the common narrative that uh, that um, that are um, that challenge uh, essentially the thesis of the film is to challenge authority and challenge the government and and uh, and we had the freedom to do that there was no kind of you know we had, there were, nobody would tell me what I couldn't film you know what I mean so uh, it's remarkable in, in this in this country that we have that kind of support, and it and it speaks to this institution, the National Film Board of Canada, which has been uh, so essential since the beginning of its founding by John Grierson, who invented the word documentary. So, because so it's I on like National it. Film Board, does that mean is there a natural uh, is there a channel outlet for all the National Film Board films, or do they have to make a deal, no, or is there is? It, yeah. So in Canada, we actually have a, a, a Canadian distributor um, and uh, they will be releasing the film theatrically and and then uh, I, uh, but um, aside, outside of this film the the National Film Board of Canada does distribution they have an online website uh, nfb.ca and you can watch many of their film films uh, you can watch regionally in Canada for free uh, and I think they do have uh, access for uh, international access for streaming. Right. I'm not sure what the payment process is, but uh, or if there is any. But uh, a I lot think of there, are, there, are, are, there are a lot of films that are available here in the states for free, and I'm a huge fan of the oh. National Film Board, and they've just done great work. Um, oh my gosh, some of my favorite uh, movies, Lonely uh, Boy about Paul Anka. Um, You know, some great. That great goes back documents. a couple of years. I I know I can remember seeing that too. Um, so, and I understand that you are in the process of writing your first dramatic 
script. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then... Yeah, I mean, I, I've, um, and that speaks to my interest in uh, storytelling, you know. And I think I think I uh, I think a fiction film and a documentary are not a fiction film or a nonfiction film are are uh, similar in the fact that you are making story and uh, working on you know building an arc and following the, the that sort of uh, that structure of storytelling. And so uh, yeah, I've started to work on this fiction film and uh, it takes place in China, mainland China. Um, you know, the, the story is sort of a, a crime drama, uh, but underneath it, of course, I'm making commentary about this modern China and um, et cetera. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you. I want to thank Thanks you so much for being uh, on this episode of West Stock Online. It's been a pleasure and an honor, and I hope everybody will make an effort to see the movie and search out the writings of Robert Fisk and see the films of Young Chang. It's, a, it's an amazing thing, actually. Diversity. Cincinnati. Incredible.